Okay, let's finish up the last few slides that we had from last time, and we're going to go into details about WebRTC. So the, the big overview of WebRTC is this is a way that we're going to establish a live streaming peer-to-peer -peer connection. So we have a serverless connection between two peers, and it's going to be live streaming in a very real sense. I always, I kind of overuse these words, live and real time, but this is as low latency real time as we can reasonably get. That's what we need. So uh, there's a problem here. Like we already have WebSockets. We could potentially create a WebSocket connection between two clients and try to use TCP. WebSockets is uh, effectively using a TCP connection and then eliminating as much overhead as we can and just using the TCP socket as our stream. We could try that, but that's going to work over TCP, which is made for, oh, I want to go back one more, uh, for TCP. I went over this really fast at the end of last lecture, so I just want to do it some justice. Um, TCP, which is meant for reliability. TCP is made to make sure that you get every byte of information that was sent to you, make sure you actually receive all of that information. But it can be slow. If you drop a packet, and the internet drops packets all the time, if a packet is dropped, TCP is going to sit there and wait, request a resend, get the packet back. You got another back and forth uh, to get that packet, then reassemble all the data, and then finally make that data available to read using like a receive method on the TCP stream. So you can't get any of that information until you get all of the information. And this is nice for our servers because we don't want to lose any information from like an HTTP request. If we drop a packet in the middle of that image that, that's being uploaded, well, we don't have the image then. It's go not going to render properly. It's going to be a broken file, potentially. Uh, so we need TCP for a lot of cases, but it is a little slow. So we need real-time. Real-time streaming, or I don't even know what to... Uh, Low-latency streaming, I think, is, is uh, probably the best way to say it. We need low-latency streaming. Because this slowness, I mean, it's not that slow. We're talking a handful of milliseconds in most cases. Um, if you're connecting to a server in California, you might get half a second for, uh, for a resend request. Um, but even then, I mean, it's not the worst thing um, in most cases. But if we're live streaming with a peer-to-peer -peer connection, and specifically a peer-to-peer -peer video call. So if we're in a Zoom meeting together and we have an extra half a second delay on our voice uh, on our voice and video, that's pretty much unusable. If you have a half second delay, that's almost impossible to have a conversation with another person if there's a half second delay in between. Uh, you just, you can't do it. You end up talking over each other, and if you ever experienced that, you, you know how horrible it can be. Uh, we need the lowest latency possible. So for that, WebRTC actually uses a different protocol called UDP, user datagram protocol instead of TCP. So the WebRTC connection, when it's a peer-to-peer -peer connection, so our servers don't have to worry about this, um, but when it's a peer-to-peer -peer connection and you're streaming audio and video, that's actually sent using UDP, which is not concerned with reliability, but is instead concerned about speed. UDP is all about getting packet from point A to point B as, uh, I won't say as fast as possible, because that's up to IP and the routers of the internet uh, to route that packet. But it's all about just sending the packet and then moving on with your life. If that packet didn't get there, if that packet's dropped, we just forget about it. We lose data. This is a lossy protocol. It's going to lose information. You're sometimes going to drop frames in the middle of the call, uh, and that's OK. Because when, you're, when you have this type of connection, when you have and you're like FaceTiming someone or calling someone on the phone or, uh, or in a Zoom meeting, if you drop some packets, getting those packets half a second later doesn't help you, especially if you have to hold up the whole call uh, and you have to watch the person buffer for a while until those packets get reset and everything. Uh, that's not what we want. If we drop some packets, we just want to move on with the call and just lose a little bit of information and then just keep moving. So this is all about speed and moving on if we drop packets. Uh, that's uh, UDP in a nutshell. If you want to know all a whole lot more about U UDP, TCP, uh, IP, modern networking concepts, I'll, I'll pitch that at least one more time right now. Uh, modern networking concepts will talk to you all about this. I have half a slide on UDP. I'm not talking about it very much. Uh, but effectively, uh, 
similar to WebSockets being using TCP, just raw TCP, uh, with as little overhead as possible, UDP is basically using IP with as little overhead as possible. You're just sending packets over the internet with very, very little overhead. So you're just using effectively raw IP uh, and little else. Uh, of course, there's more details to it. UDP does have its own headers. UDP still has port numbers like TCP, uh, things like that, but uh, very little overhead. It's trying to get as, uh, as minimal overhead as possible and just get those packets there fast. Uh, and that gives us that low latency. So we're going to talk about a bit of a uh, few servers today when I switch to the other slides. There are three types of servers. I'll go through them really quick right here because I'm about to go into them in detail. This is supposed to just be the overview uh, teaser on Monday. The signaling server, this is the one you're doing. This is going to communicate between the two peers while the connection is being established. A stun server which is going to let the peers know their public IP and port number, IP address and port number, and a turn server, which is optional for WebRTC connections, which if your firewall and NAT are too strong, these are going to end up being required in certain cases like that, uh, which are going to route all of the traffic through that server of the peer-to-peer -peer connection. If you're using a turn server, you really don't have a peer-to-peer -peer connection anymore because there's a server right in the middle. Might as well just use another service. Um, you can use anything else for that. The only one you're implementing on your homework is the signaling server. Uh, so the other ones, when I'm talking about the other servers or the peers, uh, the peers, I give you the code in the, the homework handout. The other two servers, well, we're not going to use a turn server on the homework at all. And the stun server, we're going to use a public Google stun server. As much as I don't really want to get Google involved in our peer-to-peer -peer connections, uh, it was the <laughs> easiest thing to do. Maybe next semester, uh, writing a turn server will be on the homework, but not, not today, not this time. Oh, I forgot to mention that the reason I had to make all this distinction, like YouTube streaming or Twitch, they don't use UDP, and there is a decent amount of delay. Like you, it would be difficult to, uh, on Twitch, have like a phone call with somebody else. It would be... Uh, it wouldn't work so well <clears throat> um, if they're a viewer. Like, chat's always a little bit behind. I mean, a matter of seconds, but uh, a little bit behind uh, the way Twitch does things or YouTube. Uh, the way they work is you send all your raw, your video and audio feed, and then they process it and then host it using HLS, HTTP live streaming, and then it's HTTP requests to get the video uh, over TCP. So there's a decent amount of delay there. But for something like that, we still call it live streaming, but it's not, uh, it's not low latency. You're, you're not actually live. If you were in the room with the person watching them and also watching their stream, it's going to be delayed by you know, a decent amount. I mean, not terribly much, but uh, a second or so, depending on all the connections, of course. Uh, so when, when we're saying live or real time or low latency, we mean like very low latency. We want very much, uh, uh, very quick speeds. All right, so let's get into WebRTC details. It's a little redundant when those slides are back to back, but. And we have pictures today, one of my rare slide decks where I got pictures involved. Uh, it's gonna help to visualize all the connections that are made. It's going to get a lot more complicated than a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So I pulled out, the, pulled out my picture game. UDP has really little security. Does TCP have security? Do they have different levels of security? Wouldn't you encrypt both of them? I, I, have, I haven't heard this before. I mean, I don't. <laughs> what? I am worried about it now. UDP has little security. I don't know. I have to look into that. I usually hang out at TCP or HTTP and up, but I haven't heard that one. I feel like I would hear that. I am worried about it. That doesn't make sense. I'm trying to think of how that. All right, anyway, all right. Um, so for WebRTC, our goal is to create this peer-to-peer -peer connection. 
so we can stream audio and video. Uh, there are a few problems uh, that we're going to face with this one. Our first problems are the peers need to know their IP addresses, and these peers need to negotiate how this connection is going to be made. So we can't just send a message to another device on the internet. I mean, we kind of can, but there's a problem here. So when we're sending, why would I order them that way? OK. Obviously, they're brand new slides, because I, I don't know why I would put them in that order. But anyway, uh, so to establish the connection, we need to communicate the details of uh, of the connection. So the very first thing that needs to be sent from one peer to the other, one peer is going to say, hey, I want to create a WebRTC connection. And they're going to send an offer, a WebRTC offer. If you look through the JavaScript code for the homework handout, uh, that's what I call it. I call it the message type WebRTC offer. It's not official. That's not, uh, you know, that's not in an RFC or anything. Uh, but I'm going to call it a WebRTC offer uh, as the message type which will be in a JSON object for, uh, for this offer. So they're going to send an offer, which is going to contain all kinds of details. Uh, a lot of it we don't care about. Most of it, I'll say all of it, we don't care about on the server side. Uh, but it's going to contain a lot of audiovisual uh, information about how to interpret the stream, like once the stream's all fired up and ready to go. And these, this, client, this peer is going to start sending this peer a whole bunch of bytes. This information has, uh, this offer has all the information needed to be able to make sense of those bytes. What codecs are being used, which uh, audio compression algorithm is being used, all this kind of stuff. Um, what bit rates are going to be used so you can know how to interpret the, the data. It also contains this ICE UFRAG, which is a username fragment, which is going to be used to uniquely identify this user of this connection. So if a peer is connecting to multiple peers, they're going to want to know when they receive an offer, which peer it's related to. And when they receive more messages from the same peer, they want to be able to uniquely identify the peer. So if you're building like a Zoom clone and you have multiple peers connecting to each other, you need to be able to identify them. We do that with a username fragment. The other peer is going to hopefully send back an answer. It's going to be like, yep, I agree. Let's connect. Let's do this thing. Let's create a WebRTC connection. So the other peer is going to respond with the WebRTC answer, which contains the same information, all that audiovisual data, and their own UFRAG, which will be different from the one in the offer, which will uniquely identify this peer for this connection. And once that offer is received, they're connecting. But we got a few problems. This isn't actually how it works. We got a couple of problems. You can use the IP address of the peer. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, you need a unique fragment. So if you have, so if your device is connecting to multiple peers, you need to be able to identify which one is which. So because there's actually going to be another uh, message type being sent to establish the connection, when we get that second message, we want to know which peer it relates to. And we're going to do that by matching the UFRAG. <clears throat> Mute. Yeah, the, the DOS, I, I see the, the security with that. Um, in my mind, I was reading privacy, that somebody would be able to steal your information out of that. Yeah, UDP. But, but you could always DOS with UDP, right, even if the server doesn't speak UDP. Uh, but there's a problem. How do we send these messages for usual web traffic? We have either a domain name or we click a link that usually contains a domain name. Uh, that domain name goes to a DNS lookup. The DNS server says, here's the IP address of that server you're trying to connect to. And then we send our data to that IP address, either on port 80 if it's HTTP or 443 if it's HTTPS. We request information using HTTP from that server. And then we get our response if everything goes well. 
Uh, those servers also usually have static IP addresses, not necessarily, um, but the DNS will know the current IP address of that server. And the server will be updating that DNS if they have a dynamic, uh, a dynamic IP address. So DNS is going to help us look up the IP address for the server we want to connect to. This is how it usually happens. But for peers, uh, like my laptop isn't registered in any DNS lookup right now. So to get the IP address of my laptop, uh, you're, you're going to have to do a little bit of extra work since we don't have this usual tool of the DNS. Now, if I tell you, hey, my IP address is this, yeah, you can connect directly. Uh, we might be able to connect without using a server, uh, which is where this is headed. Uh, obviously, you have to do something with your server on the homework. Um, but I, I, you know, everybody's not going to register their IP addresses with DNS, especially when your IP address is changing. You're going to have a dynamic IP address. I have a different IP address right now than I did when I was at my house this morning. Uh, and as I move around campus, I'm going to get different, um, different IP addresses as I uh, connect to different access points, potentially. Maybe, maybe I'll keep the same, maybe I won't. But it's up to UBIT's internals in their network how I'm going to get those IP addresses assigned. So that happens sometimes, too. So this is where you come in. On the homework, you're going to implement a signaling, signaling server. That's the part that you're responsible for on your homework. The signaling server is going to pass messages between the peers while they're trying to establish the connection. And your signaling server is really just going to be a go-between between between the two peers to be able to establish this. So when we have this offer and answer, one peer is going to send you an offer. You're going to just forward that offer to the other peer. That peer is going to send you an answer. You're just going to forward that answer to the other peer. For objective five, to keep things simple, you can assume that only two WebSocket connections are made. So if you get an offer or answer from one of them, send it to the other one. I'm trying to keep Objective 5 as tame as possible. And it ended up being really tame, actually, uh, as long as your WebSocket code is, uh, is hot. As long as that's working nice, uh, it's not a big deal to send these messages. Uh, if you hard coded a lot of your WebSocket stuff, you know, I don't know what to tell you. But if your WebSocket stuff uh, is really nice and, and well designed, uh, Objective 5 is honestly kind of free. So that's your goal is of the signaling server. So we still need, we have a problem here is that we need to be able to send data to, uh, to the clients without them sending a request. We need a way for our server to just send information to the clients, but holy crap, we just spent a whole week talking about WebSockets, problem solved. So now that we have WebSocket connections, both peers are going to create a WebSocket connection to the server. And then when you get one of these offers, that offer is going to be sent over that WebSocket connection. And then you go to the other WebSocket connection and send it right to the other peer. That peer doesn't have to make another request. We don't have to worry about polling or long polling or any of that, which we could use that would work for RTC, WebRTC. Uh, but typically, WebSockets are used. It's just a nicer solution than pulling or long pulling, in my opinion, at least. Uh, so just send it over that WebSocket connection and say, here's your offer. WebSockets are not required. They're not part of WebRTC. In fact, signaling servers themselves, not even in, the, in, in, uh, not even in an RFC. There's no RFC that defines what a signaling server is. There's just the RFC that says, this is what WebRTC is somehow you have to get this offer to the other peer, and somehow that peer has to get the answer back to you. And our common solution is to use a signaling server. Uh, but you could do it any way you want. You could uh, potentially email it to someone, say, hey, check your email. I sent you a WebRTC offer. And they respond with the answer. You go into the front end code of, your, of some, uh, some app, uh, which could be a desktop app even, and uh, take that offer and answer and do what you need to do with it to establish the connection, it would actually work. Uh, but we have WebSockets. We're going to do it quickly through a server, which is the common approach, is to use WebSockets for this, for the signaling server. So when you get an offer or answer, forward it to the other one. I already said all this stuff. 
but we could have any number of peers. We could have 100 peers connecting to us through this signaling server and requesting connections to any of the other peers. We could have a list of people connected, and then you could click call this person. You know, we could build all that stuff. Uh, and you're, you're more than welcome to for your project. That'd be awesome to see. Uh, but to keep the homework tame, assume that you have exactly two clients. And when we do testing of objective five, mind you, uh, for objectives one through four, we can open up 100 tabs if we want. If the TAs want to do that while they're grading, that's, uh, that's on the table. You need to be able to handle more than two website connections. But for objective five, we're going to uh, restart the server connect exactly two clients, start the video on each of them, just like I do each time in lecture, uh, start the video of each of them, and then click connect, uh, call the other, I forget what I put on the button, um, on one of those tabs and make that connection. So you can assume there's exactly two WebSocket connections during objective five and during objective five only. So when you're doing the WebRTC features, assume there are only two. Uh, or else there are a lot of other features. You really got to maintain those WebSocket connections in a meaningful way um, to be able to get that to work, which is just more tedium, and it's detracting from what I need you to get out of the assignment, which is parsing and sending WebSocket frames. That's what the homework, the crux of the homework is all about. All right, all right any questions so far? All right, let's get into the next problem. Things are getting a, a little bit more complex. It's not as simple as I just portrayed it there. We're going to keep adding stuff to this thing until we get, uh, until we actually can establish this peer-to-peer -peer connection. It's uh, uh, surprisingly complex to, to do this. Not overwhelmingly so, but you know, you know, you'll see what I mean. But we have another issue, is that the peers don't know their own IP addresses. It's just the fact of using the internet is, a device usually doesn't know its own public IP address. They're usually behind, they're usually behind a network address translation or a NAT router. And these NATs are going to convert their IP address and port number. So the way these typically work, uh, at home you'll have a router that's plugged into your ISP or plugged into a modem that's plugged into your ISP or whatever. Uh, and that ISP gives you a IP address, one IP address for the house. Uh, but you have many devices connected to that connection. So each device connected to your router is going to get a different local IP address, just typically starting with 192, 168, uh, 0 or 1, and then some value for the, the last one. You'll get some local IP address and some local port number that your browser is going to choose, which is going to connect to, uh, to that router using that port number. Uh, you see these on your server if you ever printed out the port numbers of the connections that your browser is making to your server. Port numbers are always like random, very high values that the browser chose um, to be able to open those TCP connections. So you have those. You say, hey, router, you'll send this to some uh, IP address of some server. And then to the outside world, this NAT is going to translate your IP address and port into a public IP address and port. So every device in your house has the same public IP address, but different port number. So what your router is going to do is reserve some other port number on this IP address. And then each device connected to it, say we have 10 devices over here, each with a different local IP address. They'll all have the same public IP address for all outgoing traffic to the real world, but they'll have different port numbers that the router chooses as uh, these connections are being made. So you can share IP addresses effectively. The problem is this laptop doesn't know this IP and port number. This is how this laptop is seen to the outside world, but that laptop doesn't know that information, just doesn't have that information. Uh, this is also why you have to do port forwarding. This came up a few times in this, uh, this semester already, uh, but this is why you got to do port forwarding. You're sharing an IP address with all the other devices in your house. If you want to play games on one of those devices and that game has a, port, a specific port number that it uses to connect, you want to forward traffic over this IP address and that port number for whatever you're, you're using 
uh, whatever um, the game or, uh, or software, whatever you're using, uh, whatever port they use, you say, hey, when you get a message on this IP address for that port that this app uses, send it to my laptop. Uh, that's not made for any of these other people. That's made for my laptop or my Xbox or whatever, uh, whatever you're doing with that. And the other peer has to do the same stuff. They'll have their own public and private IP import. <clears throat> so the answer to this one is going to be a stun server, which is, I don't remember what the acronym means, session traversal of user data game protocol. That's just a bunch of words to me. I don't know. But a uh, stun server sounds cool. Uh, so we're going to use a stun server, which its job is to tell you what your public IP and port are. So we're going to send a message to the stun server. The stun server is outside of our local network. And the stun server is going to be like, this is how you appear to me. You have this IP address and this port number. And then we say, cool, thanks, because uh, uh, that's going to tell us what the NAT assigned to us. That's how we look to the outside world. So if you, on your laptop, look up your IP address, you're going to get one IP address. If you go to whatsmyipaddress.com, you're going to get a different IP address. That's the difference between your public and private IP address. So the stun server is basically a public IP address lookup. We're going to use one of Google's servers. Uh, it's in the handout code. If you want to use a different stun server, I suppose I'm not stopping you. Um, but in the handout code in the JavaScript, this is the stun server. You'll see this server. We're going to connect to Google's public free server. They're going to tell us what our IP address is. And then this part's going to be done. Um, maybe next semester, definitely not this semester, maybe next semester the signaling server and the stun server will be the same server, and there'll be a different objective on the homework. Not happening this semester, though. I want to see how WebRTC goes over first. Um, I'll make sure it's, it's uh, tame enough before I start beefing it up. Uh, and then once they get their IP address, they're going to send an ICE candidate, an interactive connectivity establishment message, an ICE candidate to the other peer through our signaling server. So the ICE candidate is going to look something like this. This is one from uh, that I got from my server. I just printed it to the screen. Um, and it's going to contain some useful information here. The connection type is going to be UDP. We expect to see that. My public IP import, I, I got, I was thinking about this for a while. I actually got a, pub, a private um, IP import. I was doing everything on localhost here, but I'm still wondering why Google's server didn't say, here's your public IP. Uh, that one's still baffling me a little bit. I have to think about that uh, for a bit. But I got my port and IP address and the username fragment which is a uniquely identifying string for this connection, which is going to match the U fragment, the username fragment, from the offer or the accept um, of the connection earlier. So the way this works is offer is sent, an answer is sent, except I was thinking WebSockets. I knew it was something else. Uh, the offer is sent, the answer is sent back, and then each Client, each peer sends its candidate, its ICE candidate, to the signaling server, which forwards it to the other, um, the other peer. So we get the offer, the answer, and then using that username fragment, when we get a web, um, when we get the ICE candidate, we're going to look up that username fragment to know which connection, which offer or answer this candidate is associated with. And then that ICE candidate says, OK, you can connect to me on this IP, this port, using UDP. Uh, and I'm this person. I'm the person who sent you that offer with that other username fragment earlier. And then once we have the candidate, each peer is going to know how to connect to the other. And there can be the, the reason they're called candidates. There can be many of them. You could send like five candidate messages to the other peer. and uh, and then the other peer is going to choose their favorite one out of those five and uh, connect to you using that one. So once they have all this information, those peers are ready to connect. 
We can finally get these servers out of the way and have a true peer-to-peer -peer connection. So after everything's established, after those offers, the answers, the candidates, after all those messages have been sent, however many candidates there might be, after all those messages are sent, we finally have a peer-to-peer -peer connection. And these peers can connect. You can shut down your server. They'll still be able to communicate. Uh, once they're established, you can stop your server, sh uh, shut down Docker and everything. They're still going to be communicating because it's a true peer-to-peer -peer connection, which is what we wanted. Uh, and they can stream audio and video and whatever else. It's usually audio and video and or video. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're streaming at that point. Uh, but it can't, oh, that's what I was saying. But it can be other data. This, uh, this protocol, WebRTC protocol, we could stream any data we want. But usually, we're concerned with audio and visual data. Yeah, in 116, I had a slide with like 50 arrows. This slide was a mess. It's too many arrows. All right, any questions to this point? Especially on the part that you're, like, like I said, I warned you on Monday, there's a lot of details involved here, uh, but very few of these details you have to implement in your homework. Whereas WebSockets, I don't have a whole lot to talk about in lecture, but there's a lot you need to do in your homework. Uh, parsing frames and writing frames, it gets tricky. WebRTC, not so much. You just forward a couple of messages. So your role, you get an offer, an answer, or a candidate over a WebSocket connection. And you send that message to the other WebSocket connection. Don't overthink this one. If you have your WebSocket set up really nice, this should be just a few lines of code. You don't have to do much. You don't have to interpret any part of those messages. You're literally reading the bytes of the payload from a WebSocket frame, putting that payload in a new WebSocket frame without a mask. So you're demasking, you're doing your payload length and all that good stuff, uh, buffering. And then putting that payload in a new WebSocket frame without a mask with the same payload length and sending it to the other client. So if you have all of your WebSocket code, written and working well, then it's get a WebSocket frame, parse it, check to make sure it's not a chat message. Because if it's a chat message, obviously, you have to handle it differently. Make sure it's not a chat message. If it's a WebRTC message, generate a new frame and send it to the other client. So if you already have parsing frames and writing frames written generically and you didn't hard code it for objectives one through four, uh, then handling these three extra message types is easy day. So that's your role, at least for the homework. Like I said, next semester, we'll see how this goes. I think it's going to go pretty well. I think homework, uh, I'm optimistic that objective five will be pretty free. Objectives four and five should be pretty free as long as you did the WebSocket stuff in objectives two and three really well. So hopefully you don't prove me wrong on that and just write garbage code in two and three and then struggle through four and five. But, uh, but we'll see. But as long as it goes well, I think next semester I'll have the, uh, have the class write the stun server as well. I think that's within reach. Um, this, uh, there's not too much going on. You read the IP and port and then send it back. OK, no questions? Everyone's happy with that? <laughs> for an answer, a candidate walk into a server. Is it a problem if we add the username to the payload for the WebRTC ones, or is that just not necessary? It's not necessary for the homework. Uh, but if you want to support more than two peers connecting, that would be necessary. You'd have to say, I want to connect to that person 
then send another offer, I want to connect to that person, send another offer, I want to connect to that person. You can add that, it's not going to hurt the grading, um, as long as it's not, um, as long as it still works, as long as the testing procedure still works, and that we don't have to add the username. Uh, but if you have a nice way to do that on the front end, I wouldn't be mad at that, you know, that would still be fine. Uh, if you want to build beyond what the homework's asking. But for the homework, you don't have to add username. Like the homework, the front end code. So on Friday, I'm gonna go through the front end code that's provided on the homework. That's my plan for Friday. Uh, and that front end code generates the three message types. It uses the browser's WebRTC implementation, generates the offers, the answers, and the candidates, and then sends them to your server. So all those messages are already constructed for you. The browser already makes those messages in exactly the format that they're supposed to be in and everything. So you don't have to read them at all. And then I put them in JSON objects and then convert them to strings to send to your, uh, send to your server. So if you want to add usernames to that and modify the front end code, I'm not going to stop you, but uh, you don't have to. No, it's not required. A full walkthrough with commentary, homework three. I mean, what do, depends what you mean by that. If you mean going through the solution with a full walkthrough, obviously no. Um, but yeah, on, on Friday, the code that I provide, that big JavaScript file, it's, you know, it's a decent sized file. It's a decent amount of code. Um, I got 50 minutes to go through that all on Friday. And I will go through a full walkthrough and commentary on the code that's provided for sure. Um, but if you want something beyond that, you'd have to be specific on what you're asking. There are restrictions to WebRTC if there are no other questions. Golang tutorial when? Maybe next semester. I, I always, like, I just, I feel like this class should be Go required. Like, I, I feel like you should have to do your homework and go. Uh, someday, maybe I'll make that change. Uh, if I don't make that change, I'll probably just require Python instead of um, give me, you know, it doesn't make sense, does it? But I feel like this course should just be in Go. Um, or if I'm feeling like I, uh, feeling really, I don't even know the what feeling I'd have to be in, but I could choose C and force you to write L and C. I'd have to be pretty cruel, I think, is the, pretty evil, I think, is the, what I'd have to be feeling to make you see. But I think uh, writing this in Go someday should be required. I feel like that's where this course should be headed. Um, but yeah, maybe next semester. Oh, you mean in lecture? Oh, I see what you mean. I read that wrong. But yeah, but what I said still, uh, still applies. Uh, and next week, I do plan on doing some JavaScript. I'll do JavaScript and Python uh, to talk about how to maintain your WebSocket connections. Uh, a lot of demos next week. There's, uh, I plan on doing zero slides next week, but showing you um, like uh, tips and tricks, basically, of how to manage these WebSocket connections. And I will do, since I have a full week, I'm going to do JavaScript in addition to Python. Oh, and maybe Scala, too. And hell, maybe Golang, maybe next week. Why do you think it should be in Go? Just a lot of uh, low-level server code is written in Go these days. It's just the way it is. Uh, Go and C, uh, but new projects are typically in Go. I think people are mostly moving away from C these days. So if you're writing low-level server code like this in industry, it's probably going to be in Go. It's just something you're likely to run into. Uh, nobody's going to write this stuff in Python. Uh, you, you know, if you're writing a server, you need more performance than Python's going to give you, unless you're writing your code in C and just having Python use the C code, but at that point, we're using C. So um, it's just what you're probably going to do in industry. Yes, you'd be using frameworks if you're a web developer. That's why I say if you're doing the low-level code, like if you're, uh, if you're doing the low-level details of a server, uh, it, you know, it depends what the company's doing. If the company's just making a web app, 
you're going to use frameworks. If the company is making a really, either a really complex web app or building infrastructure, like at, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. I guess YouTube or not, uh, Netflix, I mean, same thing, basically. Uh, they're going to have their front end websites, which are going to use frameworks, and they're going to write frameworks and, and do all that stuff in whatever language, JavaScript or Python or whatever. Uh, who cares? Uh, they're going to use frameworks and just build the front end. But once that, once you get deep enough in the API, in the Netflix API, you're going to get away from frameworks, and you're going to be writing code that's for a web app, but so deep into the back end that you're, it won't it effectively won't be a web app anymore. And once you get to that level of code, you're using any language you, you want. You're not using any web technologies. You're not touching HTTP anymore, even though you are building the back end of a web app. Uh, and at that point, more and more companies, more and more organizations are moving to go for that level of code. When you need every ounce of optimization you can, but you don't want to use C because C is a pain in the ass. Uh, a lot of companies are going towards Go. <clears throat> uh, and Go is designed to be the C killer. Uh, for that specific reason. It's designed to do low-level code. Uh, it's built with concurrency in mind. Uh, it's, it has very nice optimizations, but you don't have to use C. Meanwhile, the back end at your job is written in raw PHP. And if you have under like a million users, maybe you get away with PHP or Python or whatever. Um, but if you're concerned about performance, and you need you know, lots of concurrent users, uh, you're going to move to something like Go to get that optimization. Uh, all right, so there are some restrictions to WebRTC. You can't just use this all willy-nilly, unfortunately. Uh, WebRTC does require an encrypted ex accepted. I got, uh, I got autocorrected there. Uh, but we must have an encrypted connection unless you're using localhost. So when I do my demos here, I'm using localhost with an unencrypted connection. Um, but if you wanted to have multiple devices connecting over WebRTC, you do have to encrypt that connection. So this is pretty restrictive. When you're testing, you can't really have two, uh, two machines connecting unless you encrypt that connection, which is something we'll talk about during homework four content, and we'll get to that point. Um, but for, for now, we can't have anything connected not over localhost. And sometimes we have aggressive firewalls that won't allow WebRTC connections. Uh, this is a bigger, uh, bigger problem. If you have uh, an organization, you're using a public Wi-Fi that wants to block all kinds of traffic, wants to block any ports that aren't 80 or 4, uh, 443 or something like that, uh, we might not be able to have a peer-to-peer -peer connection. For these situations, this is where turn servers come in. These are optional. Uh, for WebRTC, but are required in certain cases. You have aggressive firewalls, you have dynamic NATs that keep changing your IP address or, uh, or port number. Uh, several situations where you might need a turn server, which is going to route all of the peer-to-peer -peer traffic. So instead of having a true peer-to-peer -peer connection, the turn server, you're both going to connect to the turn server, send your stream to the turn server, and the turn server sends your stream to the other peer. Uh, I think this defeats the point of peer-to-peer. -peer. If you're getting a third-party server involved, like, why even bother with WebRTC? Just use a different technology. If you're going to use a, a server anyway, unless you have your own turn server. Uh, you can, there are open source turn libraries out there where you can run your own turn server on your server that you control and then connect peer-to-peer uh, -peer through your server. Uh, that's a possibility, too. Uh, that would be the way to do it. All right, any other questions? That's my last slide. And once you submit, you know, that's all I got for you. So have a great day, and I'll see you Friday.